everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this session as part of Tipping Point, Connecticut's first affordable housing conference series. My name is Kylie Goslin. I'm the executive director of the Partnership for Strong Communities. And throughout the week, the, week, the partnership is hosting over 30 different sessions featuring local, state, and national uh, experts leading conversation that explore challenges, share best practices, and coalesce us around critical next steps to address key affordable housing issues here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, join the conversation. You can join the conversation about Tipping Point on Twitter at hashtag Tipping Point 2020 um, and follow us at, at PSC Housing if you aren't already. Uh, you've joined us for the session today about live tech developments from concepts to reality. We have an awesome panel lined up to give you um, a great presentation. Uh, before we turn it over to the presenters, though, I wanted to do a few housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, uh, thank you to our uh, sponsors, our leading sponsors, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, and as always, the Melville Charitable Trust. Their deep support has allowed us to, con to continue this conference series. And thank you to our collaborating sponsors, the De Connecticut Department of Housing, Housing Enterprises, Inc., and Whittlesey, all represented here uh, today. And a big uh, thank you again to all of our presenters for joining us and presenting the information here that we're about to share. I'm gonna know, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen with you for a moment here. Um, some housekeeping notes, we are in not in a, a webinar format with Zoom or in a regular meeting session with Zoom. So this session is being recorded. We're going to make all of the sessions available on our website at pschousing.org um, as soon as the conference is over. You've all uh, entered as muted. I'm going to ask that you remain on mute for the duration of the session unless a presenter has asked you to unmute. Uh, if you have any technology issues at all during the session, please use the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Just let us know you're having a tech issue and we'll do our best to help you resolve it. Uh, the chat window for purposes of this session is also where you should enter questions and our presenters will be handling those questions uh, at the conclusion of their presentation. Also, a few minutes before the end of the session, we'll launch a poll that asks for your feedback. Please take a minute and share with us to help us improve conference offerings and future webinars. And then lastly, the Partnership for Strong Communities is in the process of uh, really working to better understand the needs of our communities and affordable housing partners. We're engaging in a strategic planning process for our home Connecticut affordable housing campaign. We want to hear from you. So toward the end of the session, I'll be posting a link in the chat for a survey. We'd love it if you took five minutes and it, we designed it to only be a five minute survey um, in addition to the poll to share your feedback about affordable housing issues in the state of Connecticut. All right, I, with that, I'm now gonna turn it over to our presenters to get us started. So Ed, why don't you kick us off? Okay, I have uh, shared my screen. Just wanna make sure that that's visible. Nico, do you see it? Perfect. Yeah. All right, well, my name's Ed Engberg. I'm a partner for at Whittlesey. And um, I just wanted to first start off by thanking the partnership for, Partnership for Strong Communities for putting on uh, the Tipping Point Conference. Um, Nico, Carol Martin, and myself also were all former board members of the Affordable Housing Alliance, um, also that was previously known as the Connecticut Housing Coalition. Um, that entity has now been dissolved, but we are definitely grateful for um, the conference that's being put on by the partnership and uh, for the advocacy that continues in Connecticut. Our goal of this presentation is to walk you through um, from how low-income housing tax credits, how they came about, how they work, and how they are a significant part of making affordable housing a reality. Just want to quickly just go through what's our presentation agenda. So, um, Nico Eustis uh, will go next, and he's going to cover how the low-income housing tax credit program works. Jenna Zachary is going to go through and talk about um, kind of Connecticut and how affordable housing is playing out in Connecticut and uh, some other matters with low-income housing tax credits. Myself, I'm going to cover why the low-income housing tax credit program works. 
we have Dave Berto, who's going to come in and talk about next steps. And he's going to bring it from a developer owner's rep kind of perspective and walk you through Litex from development from concept to reality. Then we also have Carol Martin here today, um, who's going to walk you through uh, one of the deals that uh, she was um, involved in developing, which is Sasco Creek Housing Associates Limited Partnership. Okay, let's see. All right, just quick uh, introduction. Um, so we have our three Whittlesea presenters um, that are part of Whittlesea's affordable housing team. Um, our affordable housing team at Whittlesea works on affordable housing, <clears throat> providing adv advisory services, insurance, and tax services um, to affordable housing projects for all parts of the affordable housing cycle, including pre-development, construction operations, and syndication or redevelopment. So those are all areas that our firm uh, works on affordable housing deals. And then we um, have Dave Berto, who is uh, the president of Housing Enterprises, Inc. And, um, and then we also have Carol Martin, who is executive director uh, for Westport and Fairfield Housing Authorities, um, as well as each of them have their own development arm. And she is um, the manager for each of those development arms as well. I'm sorry. All right, so now I'm going to go to uh, Nico Yunusis, and he's going to kick off our uh, next uh, section of our presentation. All right, thanks, Ed, and, and welcome to everyone. And, and thanks again to Kylie and the partnership for putting this this on. It's it's great to see that uh, as a former board member of the Housing Coalition uh, Affordable Housing Alliance, it's great to see that probably the 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 primary the, the most well known event that that organization had was the fall conference and, and to see that it lives on like this is is great to see. Um, I've done a lot of presenting in my life. This is my first time I've actually presented on Zoom to uh, I'll say fifty people that I probably don't know all that well. Although as I look at the names come across, I do certainly recognize many of them of having worked with you in the past on affordable housing projects. I'm going to give you a quick um, high level just kind of what is. The, the low income housing tax credit program, um, just to kind of set the table for some of the others that are gonna to speak today. Um, there's about 10 slides that I'm gonna to try to cover in the next eight or nine minutes. Um, first one here is the, the program was created in 1986 um, and it's really driven through the tax code. And it's, it's basically a, a tax credit on your tax return. So for those of you that file your 1040 tax return, you usually get to the bottom of it and it says, you know, amount of tax and, and, and hope some of, some of us always hope that there's a refund coming back our way. Some of us unfortunately have to pay taxes some years. Um, so basically when you get to the bottom of that return, this is basically giving you more money. So, so if it, if that tax return that you file every year says you owe $500 and you have $500 credit, well, thankfully you don't have to write a check to the IRS that year because that credit offsets it. So it's really just a dollar for dollar ability to reduce uh, your, your tax liability and ultimately the amount that you owe. Want to slide it, Ed? Okay. Um, the, the next slide really just kind of covers, again, kind of at a high level and, and what kind of makes this program neat is that the, I, I call it the X the X is on this. So you see the federal government, although it's involved, there's no money going back and forth between the federal government and any of the people involved in these. So really the investors in these programs are predominantly banks and insurance companies who send money to affordable housing projects to help them get built. Those affordable housing projects turn around and send the banks and insurance companies tax credits that then they can use on their returns. So as you can see, all the money in this little diagram is kind of going up and down as opposed to through the federal government. So it's a way for the federal government to, to promote um, affordable housing without having to go through the administrative aspects of collecting money and sending money out and all that. Um, a little more history on the program. It, it, it's been a very successful program for the United States. Um, it started in 1987. As you can see, there's been over 3 million um, housing units created because of this. And the, the latest data I could find on, on, the, on HUD's website was 
through 2018, and, and we're averaging about 106,000 units per year are being placed annually um, as part of this program. So a very successful program. The next slide um, gives you just kind of a real high level, hopefully understanding of how this works. Uh, so at the bottom left is the property itself, which is what we all are interested in because that's where the beds are that people get to stay in. Um, and, and who owns that property? Well, unfortunately at the beginning, the, a not-for-profit or it could be a for-profit only owns up at max 1%. And 99% of it is owned by this fund. And fund is basically um, money that's brought together. And, and a lot of the money that comes into these funds are from financial institutions. So banks basically put a bunch of money, they put a big pile of money into these funds. And these funds invest in, in I've seen funds that have 30 properties in them. Some have one, um, but these funds invest in properties. Um, and then the property, um, the, there's a general partner who's a 1% owner and typically a not-for-profit own that general partner. And they're the ones who basically run everything. So that, that ABC property owns the property. They typically hire an outside property manager to manage it, although we do have some uh, not-for-profits that run their own, you know, manage their own properties. And um, the general partner is the one who puts the deal together. So they basically come up with the idea and that's where Dave is gonna talk a little bit later about kind of how they get put together and Carol's gonna give us an example of, of one of her projects. Um, so the general partner puts the deal together and then um, brings in all these other investors. Um, the other players involved are, there's a developer. So typically a general, you know, the, the not-for-profits don't know how to build their own, their own projects. So they bring in developers who are build the project. And then, um, as we said, we have the upper tier investors who, who put the money in. Now, Ed, if you want to go back to the, to the slide with the chart, um, th that XYZ property fund is typically put together by someone who's called a syndicator. So a syndicator is someone who goes and finds all these banks, gathers all the money from them, puts this, this fund together, and then, um, invest the money in the funds to the various properties. So the syndicators are important as well because um, they're the ones that, that bring all the investors together that have the money that, that we put into this. So Ed, if you wanna go, go, go down a couple slides now. Um, we, I mentioned the, the investors and the investors are frequently financial institutions. And, and the reason they get involved in these is something called the Community Reinvestment Act. So frequently, um, if, you're a, if you're, I'll pick on Bank of America. I don't know if we have anybody from Bank of America on the call today, but I know Bank of America is a regular um, contributor to uh, these types of programs. So they're very involved with these programs. In order for Bank of America to, to um, gain the ability to, um, to, to have branches, et cetera, in certain areas, they need to invest in these areas. So the Federal Reserve monitors how they invest in these areas. And the tax credit program is one of the ways that Bank of America, for example, uh, gets credit for investing in a certain area. So that's how they get involved. Um, the next slide Ed shows that the IRS is the regulator. And a very key person here that I haven't mentioned yet is the state housing authority. So in Connecticut, it's, it's the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, and they, they are the ones who control how um, the credits are awarded, obviously within the federal guidelines. Um, they, they are in charge of monitoring. And in Connecticut, um, also um, additional financing in by providing loans to property. So they're, they're a very important player in all of this, although they aren't on the chart. They're kind of all over the chart, so to speak. Um, but a key, a key player. Um, in terms of awarding credits, you might say, well, can I go do this? Can, you know, can me and my wife go do one of these deals if we want to? And, and really, as I mentioned, um, I don't think there's many of us that have a million dollars of crap tax credits that we need every year to put on our tax return. So really, for an individual person, it, it doesn't behoove them to do that. That's why the investors in these are predominantly um, financial institutions that, you know, they have a tax return just like we do. Obviously, theirs is a little bit more complex than ours. But um, from, from that perspective, uh, those institutions um, are the ones that invest. And they invest because uh, they have to follow certain regulations. We mentioned uh, the, 
the CHAFO um, has to monitor the application process. And basically, and Jenna's gonna talk about this a little bit more later, is in Connecticut, um, for 9% projects, we have $8.4 million a year that are awarded. Wanna go to the next slide, Ed? One might ask, what is low income and, and what qualifies as low income? And, and there are a number of rules and, and we'll talk a little bit later about forming a team and, and why you need a lot of people that understand this well to, to help you. But um, there, there are a bunch of rules in terms of what income levels people have to have. You'll also have projects that are what are called mixed projects where a component of them is affordable and a, com a component of them are market units. Uh, my daughter just graduated from college with her roommate and she lives in a, in a tax credit project in Washington, D.C., whereby, you know, she's in one of the market units um, in one of these projects. And I've been there several times that, you know, th there is no difference between the market units and the affordable units. It, it is one community. But these are some of the income guidelines. And, of course, as you, as you go down the process of trying to apply, um, there's different levels that you need to try to meet. And I won't go much more than that. Uh, the next area that you really got to kind of focus on once the project is up and running is you have to maintain compliance for a period of 15 years, even though the tax credits are awarded over 10. And basically what that means is um, there has to be, the, the tenants living there have to be at a certain, either at or below a certain income level. And um, you have to monitor to make sure that that, that is still the case. Um, there's also monitoring done of cash receipts and, and dispersing. Um, and, and all of this is administered in Connecticut. The, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority follows HUD's, HUD's rules, um, which is uh, the, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has set up rules in terms of um, what, what compliance has to be followed. And then the last slide I have is just kind of a quick timeline to summarize. So basically, you put one of these deals together. Um, form a partnership, you get your, your team on board of, of different um, experts that have knowledge in this area. Um, you put a presentation together to try out to, 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 to win an investor. You then apply to, to Chaffa for tax credits. And a lot of deals, unfortunately, stop there. I, I think it's about one in three deals probably win tax credits at Chaffa. So unfortunately, two thirds of them fall off the board there. And then the remaining two thirds um, will get a, a, a reservation of credits, construct the project, put it in service, and then basically run the project for the next 15 years. And Ed will talk a little bit about more of this later. One of the, the nice aspects of this program is typically at the end of 15 years or 16 years, those investors want to walk away. They, they got out of what they wanted in terms of tax credits, and they want to walk away, and they typically will walk away at a very negligible price. So therefore, the not-for-profit or the for-profit entity will now own this apartment project um, without other investors. With that, I think, Ed, I'll turn it back to you to go on to the next section. Okay, the next section is going to be uh, Jenna Zachary is going to come and talk a little bit more about Connecticut and LIHTC. And um, Jenna, I'll let you kick it off. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm a manager at Whittlesey. I've been there for about a little over 12 years, and I have about 12 years of experience in, um, in affordable housing. My portion of the presentation, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the allocation process as well as talk about some statistics and trends um, that we, we thought you'd find interesting. So as Nico talked about before, tax credits are administered by CHFA. For those of you who don't know, CHAFA was established in 1969 with the mission to allevi alleviate the shortage of affordable housing in Connecticut. So part of their mission is to spread information. So I, um, I obtained their March 2020 report called The Path to Affordable Housing that gave some statistics I thought you'd find interesting. Um, since the LIHTC was introduced back in 1986, 25,700 units have been constructed, which have serviced over 59,000 um, households in Connecticut. Uh, in Connecticut, our composition, we have 34% of our households are renters, which translates to almost 459,000 households. And out of those, 128,000 earn 30% of area median income or less. To put, to put that into perspective, um, if you're thinking about the Hartford area, a household of one person um, has an AMI of about 
um, $70,000. So 30% of that amount is about $20,000. So we're talking about people who, own, who, who earn a lot less than, you know, the rest of the people in their area. And, you know, thinking about those numbers, it's not really a surprise to see that two thirds of those renters are considered to be se severely cost burdened, which means they're, they're spending over 50% of their income just to be housed on rent and utilities. Um, so right now, Connecticut has a shortage of about 79,000 units. Um, over the last 34 years of the tax credit, you know, that's about a 750 unit average per year based on what Connecticut is able to allocate in tax credits. Um, CHFA said that if they got a 50% increase in the allocation authority, that would get us over uh, 2,900 units over the next uh, 10 years, which would certainly be helpful. Um, but to, to focus back on you know, the allocation of credits, um, what, CH, what CHFA does every year is they uh, publish a qualified allocation plan um, which talks about many things, but the main um, purpose of which is to establish policies and procedures around the reservation, allocation, and compliance monitoring of LIHTC. So there's a lot to that allocation plan, but what I want to talk about today is the credit award process. So, you know, let's say that you've decided you want to, you want to develop affordable housing, um, you know where you want to put it, you have a team, what are the steps? So what you end up doing is filing an application with CHFA. So um, what Nico was saying before, um, you know, CHFA has about $8.4 million in credits that they can allocate every year, but the number of allocations that they get greatly exceeds what they can actually allocate. So what they do is they take your application and they score it based on a number of factors. And the, this allocation plan um, details uh, what those factors are. So you can see here, you know, the, the criteria that they look at and the number of points that you get on your application um, maximum, you know, for those sections. So, you know, they want to know that you're going to be servicing um, families who make less than 50% of AMI. They want to make sure that your application um, uh, would be an effective use of the credits. They want to make sure that you have a positive local impact. Um, you know, are you uh, redeveloping an existing commercial property or a brownfield site? That'll get you more points. Opportunity characteristics. Um, what, what are the future benefits for your future tenants just by living where you're putting the affordable housing complex? And qualifications and experience rounds out the 100 points, you know, your development team. Dave Berto will be going over this a little bit later, but you know this directly impacts the strength of your application. Um, and then you do get, you could get an additional three points if you were to redevelop something in the state-sponsored housing portfolio. Um, that portfolio is composed of aging moderate rental in, uh, units that you know this that you know the state and CHFA obviously um, would like to see um, redeveloped into affordable housing. Um, so the one um, criteria that I want to focus on um, quickly, because um, I think it, it has a bigger impact than the 15 points the section is allocated really um, indicates, is the opportunity characteristics. So basically, uh, opportunity characteristics focuses on, like I said, the future opportunity, the opportunities that your future tenants could have just by being the location that you're building. So um, depending on you know, where you're looking to develop, you have different opportunities based on you know, future employment opportunities, access to higher education, access to good school systems, and an overall lower um, poverty rate in that area. So you can see um, on this map here, CHFA publishes this every year um, in, accordance with their 2020 qualified allocation plan. You can see the areas in the state, um, you know, if they're dark blue, your Danberries, your Waterberries, if you're building there or trying to build there, you're probably gonna receive zero to four points on your application. Um, light, if you're looking at the light blue, that's five to eight. If you're looking at the yellow areas, that's nine to 11. 
And if you're looking at the red areas like West Hartford or Greenwich, you know, just by building in that location, that will secure you 12 to 15 points on your application. Um, so if you look at the next slide, what I did is I compiled like a three year analysis. So what these colors mean is that it coincides with the map that you just saw. So your dark blue um, represent, so in the first column, you'll see the 2020 applications. Um, you'll see that two applications were submitted for areas in the dark blue portions of the map. Nine were submitted for the light blue portions of the map and five were submitted for the red sections. And then you can see when you look at the next um, bar in the graph, the actual awards, they awarded four in the light blue section and um, three in the red sections. So, and if you look at the three year years as a trend, you can see that, you know, if you're trying to build in the Danberries or the Waterberries, like those applications have had a 0% success rate over the last three years. If you're looking in the light blues, your Hartfords and your New Havens, that have ha has had more like a 33 to 44% success rate. Your yellows, 50 to 67, and your reds, um, 50 to 100%. So, you know, honestly, can't really tell you why, um, you know, red, certain red properties wouldn't have gotten accepted, but um, you can see that, you know, based on where you try to build your success rate to actually receive these credits could be significantly impacted. Um, the last slide um, is just a, a summation of where I got all of my information um, just to be uh, completely transparent there. So you can, you know, click around. There's a lot, a wealth of information on Chaffa's website, um, but I thought you'd find these useful. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Ed so you can uh, hear why the LIHTC program works. Okay. Um, so again, I'm Ed Engberg. I'm a partner at Whittlesea, and I'm also a chair of our real estate niche. Um, I just want to, um, I'll get us going into why the program works. Um, I also want to try to shave a few minutes uh, to make sure that I leave plenty of time for Dave Berto and Carol and Martin uh, for their sections. Uh, so just quickly going into why this program works for the government, you know, I think um, Jenna and Nico have done a really good job um, at talking about how this is a tool, especially Nico talked about how, you know, it really just kind of, you know, it's not taking the immediate funds away from the government. Um, and it's, it's kind of just passing it right through by having limited partners, investors invest directly in deals. Um, and so, you know, what it's doing, it's, it's providing, you know, over 3 million units of affordable housing. And when we look about, you know, where the majority of the activity is occurring for affordable housing, it's occurring with LIHTC deals. Um, some of the other benefits, which are great as part of affordable housing deals are, you know, it's creating jobs. You know, it's, um, you know, construction jobs, jobs around that community. It's helping redeveloping struggling communities. Um, you know, some of the other benefits, uh, you know, big picture um, that's the most obvious is that it's providing housing to lower income families. But with that, that frees up resources for those families that they can spend on health care, they can spend on food. Um, If we then go in a look at, you know, how this benefits owners. So I, I think, you know, for owners, there's really two types, nonprofit, governmental, and for-profit. For nonprofits, it's supporting their mission. You know, one of the most popular missions um, is ending homelessness. Um, and so a lot of nonprofits, you know, they're doing their, their normal nonprofit work, and they realize there's a lot of people who need affordable housing. And so a lot of them also become affordable housing developers and own property. Um, there's fees and there's cash flows, which I'm gonna go over in the next section, which could also be benefits, uh, you know, kind of a dual purpose. So one, you're taking care of your mission, but two, it could also be, in some instances, it could also help subsidize some operations as well. Um, as Nico has talked about year 15, you know, limited partner investor goes away, hopefully, and hopefully without having to pay too much of uh, what we call an exit tax. Um, in those situations, now you solely own the property. Um, there's there's many other benefits that come along with that. You can re-syndicate a deal. You can, you know, there could even be opportunities for refinancing. For a for-profit developer, it's pretty much a lot of the same, you know, benefits. 
um, other than a for-profit is strictly, you know, they're looking to turn a profit, whereas a nonprofit is more mission oriented. Um, and their profits, uh, if they earn a profit from the development, it's going back into their overall operations. We again going back into some of the benefits for the owners. There's developer fees. Um, now that it, you know, when it comes to developer fees, big picture with that is, you know, the the more of the as long as the developer fee is being mainly paid upfront versus deferred, then that's a significant benefit. Um, you know, if you have a property that's expecting to have significant cash flows, then you know, could be okay to have somewhat of a deferred developer fee. Um, when we think about management fees, that really could be beneficial for an owner when they have many properties. They certainly need to have the LIHTC knowledge to be able to handle the compliance matters um, and really only works well for managing um, your own prop properties, uh, you know, when you have a significant number of, of projects. Cash flows on these deals can come from when a property the property's operations, its operating revenue is in excess of, ex of its expenses. Um, and so with that, then they could have the ability to have distributions out of surplus cash, and um, which is you know, another benefit for both nonprofit and for-profit investors. Just quickly looking at some um, you know, of how this works for owners. Big picture, an owner is trying to get an equity investment in the project from an investor, okay? And that equity investment comes in because a limited partner is looking to purchase tax credits. So with that, um, tax credits are earned based on eligible basis. An eligible basis is really costs that are depreciable costs. So another way to put it are costs inextricably related to the building. So if you were to pull that building out and replace it at that time, you know, what would be the cost that you would have to incur to rebuild that development? So let's just say you had eligible basis of a million dollars, okay? And so if you were to then to say, what percent of the units are allocated to low-income housing? Well, if it's all 100% low-income housing units, then you're gonna multiply that by 100%, okay? So you're still having your million dollars. And then outside of that, there can be 4% deals, 9% deals. Um, when you think about a 4% deal, you're gonna end up with approximately um, getting tax credits or getting equity of about 33% of what your eligible basis was. So, um, and that would be what your equity would be for tax credits over 10 years. So that million dollars of eligible basis would turn into around $330,000 of tax credits. And then you multiply that by equity price. Equity price can really vary anywhere between 85 cents on a dollar to a dollar for a dollar. It really depends on where the demand lies in that area for Community Reinvestment Act. Um, so if there's a need for more CRA credits in that area, there's gonna be more demand, that demand's gonna drive the equity price. And then that's gonna to lead to the equity that's in the investment, which really that equity is trying to close the gap, which makes the property more affordable by bringing down the financing and other sources of funds that are needed for the deal. We think about investors, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but there's, you know, CR, there's those investors seeking CRA credits and economic, so the CRA investors are gonna to look to invest in certain areas that are gonna be low and more moderate income neighborhoods. Um, so they're gonna be more tied to the location of the investments. And also those investors are gonna benefit from tax credits and losses generated from the product, I mean, from the project. An economic investor, it's been kind of similar, but an economic investor is gonna have more flexibility in location of projects but they're also gonna seek a return from credits and losses generated from the investments. So benefits for the investors, um, we've kind of covered this a little bit in other sections, but they're gonna benefit from the tax credits, which offset the income tax liability. And they're also gonna benefit from losses of the deal, which offset their taxable income. Some of the challenges are that there are more rental assistance um, that is needed than re rental assistance available. These deals can be more time consuming than a normal real estate um, development. There can be higher transaction costs. 
Um, and it definitely involves pooling of resources from multiple investors. <clears throat> There's also other you know, areas of this uh, program that can cause investments to occur in um, poorer communities, you know, based on getting a boost, based on where you develop, you know, certain areas get a boost in credits. And so it's almost pushing investors to want to do more deals in those areas because they're going to end up with more basis. Um, one of the other things that this could be a pro, this could be a con, is that units not required to be permanently affordable. So, you know, eventually after a compliance period ends, a deal could um, at that point be uh, converted to, um, you know, a market rate unit or market rate, market rate project. Um, it also can be significantly impacted by the tax code. So lower tax rate, lower tax rates can impact the value of tax credits and losses taken by investors. Um, at this point, I'm going to transition over to Dave Berto, and he's going to do next steps on low-income housing tax credit developments from concept to reality. Yes, thank you. This is a great session. A lot's been talked about so far. This whole session really should be probably two days instead of one hour because there's no way you can cover even the stuff that's been talked so far. But the uh, stuff so far has been a very good lead in. What I've uh, done in the past has had a much longer presentation and the subject of my presentation is what you see in the middle of the slide here with all these abbreviations. I'll let you figure out what that is. Um, my company, I've been doing this for 26 years, helping groups do affordable housing. It's hard, but it's very beneficial, as has been said. So I'll give you a hint on the title in the middle by going to the next slide. And from there, you can guess what the other title was. But uh, low-income housing tax credits, how you actually do it, you know, it's, as has been said, it's very effective, but it's also very hard. And I would say it can be very high risk, but the risk is uh, manageable and you can manage it if you have a good team and you manage the project properly and you plan and incorporate for contingencies. So that's not too different from most everything else we do. But that's the whole secret here is put a team together, manage it and deal with changes. So the next slide, this is the, this is the only slide you need to know about how to do tax credits because every one of these is about 30 other or 100 other slides. You really have to understand the program. You have to understand all the intricacies of the program. And one of the ways you can do that is through what you know and through bringing in the team. So together, the team understands the program. You have to plan the program out from the beginning to the end in detail. And even some things you don't think you need to plan till later on, you should be pre-planning them now because you, what you do now will affect being ready for later. And then it's not going to go that way. So you have to have already thought through your alternate plans, your plan B, C, D, or however many you have, depending on what you learn. Once you've understood it and you've done your planning, that doesn't do any good unless you actually then manage it. And from the managing, make adjustments so that you can get to the end. I was putting this together and it's, I was reminded this is sort of the same thing we learned to do when I operated nuclear submarines. So this is about as hard as that is, and the process is the same. But this is the one slide. So uh, going through some of the details, we don't have time to go through all the details. But as I said, with a team, you're not going to get a perfect team, but you should get a good team and then you should know the limitations of that team and you should manage those limitations because that's what you have to do with everything. We've, they've already talked about the investor and the contributions. Everybody looks at how much money the investor is gonna bring in. 
but you also need to look at the terms that go with that, the timing that goes with that, the limitations that go with that. Sometimes the highest dollar value may not be best for your project, and that's a whole other uh, session by itself. Uh, the adjusters at the end, the tax credit folks will determine whether you followed all of the requirements that they use when they determined how many tax credits they were going to give you. And if you didn't, they will tell you up front what the math will be on the changes and the adjustments to how much money they're going to give you. It's great if you come in just like you say, it's great if you come in a little bit better, but it's not terrible if you come in a little bit lower and you have an adjustment, it happens. But again, know where you're going and manage it to minimize that. But in reality, it, it happens. As far as the applications are concerned, you've got to do a, a fair number of applications. You can't just put in one application. Uh, if you're doing a 4% tax credit, which uh, we do a lot of, and Carol's going to talk about, you know, you'll have a, a, a chaffa application, you'll have a DOH application, those will be both on the Con app, consolidated application, but you may need other money, you may have to put in a federal home loan bank application or a different application. So they all have different requirements, they all have different scoring, they all have different forms, they all have different timing, and you have to integrate all those in a way that allows you to get all your awards conditionally on everybody else. The awards will then come from that. When you get to the point of getting ready to close and start your project, every one of those is going to have different closing checklists. You know, they'll all be 10 pages long and have 100 items on them. They'll all be different, but some will be the same. So you just have to manage all of those together, plan for them, pre-plan for the longer items and you know assign out the work to the different people and then get the, all the early stuff done and assign the longer stuff early so that it gets done and update your checklist now people don't update their checklist very well and if you, without that you don't really know where you're where you are at any time then it gets easier the closings, you should be able to sleep through the closings because you've done everything by then. And construction, I can't say you can sleep through construction, but you know everybody knows how to do construction and that's where the fun part is. So you still have to manage it. You have to manage the payments and the cash flow and the timing, the schedule, and of course, any change orders. Again, know ahead of time, anticipate them to minimize the negative aspects. But uh, the schedule is important because it's going to be important when you put project in service for tax credits, which we'll talk about next. And then construction completion. You have to get through construction completion in order to be able to turn the project over and then get ready for occupancy. As far as completion and operations is concerned, everything you've done so far is interrelated. And even at this point, the construction and the operations numbers are interrelated and the process and the things you found during construction will affect your occupancy and your operations. And so whatever you ended up with at the end of construction, you know, that's a year after you put in your application. That's 18 months after you put your application together. So you re-benchmark your operations as you're getting started in operations with the best and the better numbers that you have at the time. One of the things about low income housing tax credits is they don't start when the project is complete. They start when people move in and you have occupancy. So just because a project is complete doesn't mean you're good to go as far as the tax credit compliance and the adjusters are concerned. Again, 
understand. And then to get to final closing, most of your investors are going to require you to have three months of stable operation with a debt service coverage ratio, probably 1.15, because this is their criteria for their investors that they have a project here, and this is when they put in the largest amount of money at the end. So it's not just you complete it and you occupy it before you're done. You've got to now to get stable operations and everything else as far as getting ready for final closing and the final payments. They talked about compliance and oversight. Very important. It's uh, lots of different requirements, but as was said at the beginning, this is really an IRS project when you get down to it. And there are significant penalties by the IRS to the investor, which then gets passed on to you if there are compliance issues. So again, have a good team, know what's going on and manage the team. And then you can get to the cost certification, which allows you to get to the final closing and close everything else out. And, you know, in seven minutes, that's the highlight of you know, a day and a half, but here's that same slide again. This is the slide from my perspective. You can also use it for other things. We'll, we'll give it to you. You can use it for operating, or dealing with your kids or anything else. All right. You, you really have to understand what's going on and then you have to plan and manage and adjust. And that's a real five minute answer to how to do it, or at least how to think about doing it. That's it, thanks. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, I really appreciate your presentation and you did a great job giving us a crash course there and uh, um, what it's, you know, some of the tasks that you take on as a developer and an owner's rep. Um, so now I'm gonna transfer over to Carol Martin and she's gonna walk us through um, some experiences, um, lessons learned and um, some wisdom on the Saskatoon Creek Housing Associates Limited Partnership. Thanks, Ed, and thanks everybody for attending and uh, joining us. And David, thank you very much. Your slides were, uh, as always, very enjoyable and very educational. Um, so uh, Sasco Creek Housing Associates Limited Partnership, boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Well, the this IRS program uh, requires you to set up a partnership in order to uh, utilize the, um, the tax credit. So uh, therein lies the mouthful. And um, I'm lucky, lucky enough to introduce um, the mobile trailer park in Westport, Connecticut. You won't find it anymore and you'll, you're gonna know why in a few minutes, but it was uh, a mobile trailer park that had 35 um, mobile trailers, homes, uh, and they were single trailers. So, you know, it was really standalone. And since 1985, it was affordable housing in the town of Westport, uh, owned and managed by the Westport Housing Authority. But as I'm, I'm sure you know, after seeing um, the likes of FEMA trailers, you know, they're really not built for sustainability. Um, and what was happening is, you know, these trailers obviously were not built to life safety codes and fire codes and, and all the amenities that were around other homes uh, at Sasco. Um, and so the housing authority embarked upon uh, trying to replace them. And, you know, the workhorse, frankly, um, and the beauty of low-income housing tax credits is that, um, you know, uh, it's a great tool uh, to redevelop and create actually new affordable housing, and it's been successfully done for years. And so this slide here basically tells you when we started the replacement of the trailer park, we actually had single family, uh, single uh, townhouse, uh, multifamily townhouse buildings uh, at the back end of the property. And so obviously one of the goals that the housing authority had was, you know, we had two separate entities on two separate types of housing types, but when we redeveloped it, obviously the goal was to integrate it. And so, you know, the architect and the design team obviously had their work cut out for them. So, um, you know, 
It's right on Route 1. It's a great place in Westport, literally, you know, just a little over a mile to Greens Farm Elementary School, which is a highly rated elementary school in the state of Connecticut. Um, we, uh, we took the 35 units uh, off the site and we constructed 54 uh, brand new LIHTC units, one, two, and three bedroom units on the site. Thanks, Ed. And uh, that's the site plan. And hopefully you can figure out just exactly how surgical this was, but the uh, darker color, uh, we'll call them tan or brown, the darker color were the existing stick built townhomes that the housing authority had uh, constructed in 2000. And the lighter shade uh, buildings that you see on the site plan became um, uh, buildings that were constructed using 4% LIHTC and um, tax exempt bond financing. And um, talk about planning, um, you know, and pre planning. Uh, David you know, hit the proverbial nail on the head. So, you know, all of this entire site was occupied. Uh, so, you know, the most challenging uh, aspects of this particular project and any project uh, that you're trying to do that is occupied is relocation. And so, you know, one of the greatest challenges we had was, you know, being able to relocate families uh, in the red shaded phase one area, approximately 18 families off site and realizing the rental market in Westport is not quite affordable. You know, it was a lot of planning on moving folks out uh, and being ready, obviously, when we were ready to close and get started with construction, that we were able to do it because families cooperated. And this slide is a classic about the assumptions we all have to make uh, when we're proceeding and, and planning out a project. You know, our budget uh, for relocation was $450,000. Our actual costs were $514,391, and obviously, a difference of $64,391. Well, why is that good or bad? Well, you know, relocation is one of those costs as uh, Nico and Ed have uh, told us about and David as well, is relocation costs are not an eligible basis. So you can't use a tax credit dollar uh, to fund these. So in other words, you know, uh, if you don't, uh, if you have cost overruns, you certainly don't want them to be uh, non-eligible. Um, and in this particular case, uh, it was, but we were able to successfully cover that uh, um, with other types of financing. And there you have it, concept to reality. Our conceptual started around September 2012, and we were fully uh, built out and occupied uh, by November 2015. So that takes you all the way through local land use and um, all the way through uh, construction and occupancy. So um, easy, I guess, but not so easy. Um, lessons learned. Well, a couple of things I think are really important. Um, we, um, we actually did try to get 9% tax credits and we did, did go through a competitive application. We did not receive it. And really what I wanna leave folks here today with is, you know, if the state and CHAPA really like the project and really think the team is well put together and can execute, you know, folks will get around the table and help you plan out what other sources might become available. So keep in mind, it's a highly competitive process, but just because you're not awarded 9% tax credits, please know there are other ways to do your project. And it's just a matter of sitting down with the folks at DOH and the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority and trying to get together a different type of financing strategy. The other thing I wanted to say, lessons learned, is it's all about eligible basis. And Ed, you can laugh at this. Uh, for full disclosure, Ed was my, uh, <laughs> my uh, accountant on this project. He did a terrific job, by the way. Um, and you know, it's all about the assumptions you make in advance and the commitment you, do, uh, you give to the tax credit investors. And those are, the, those are the things where if you get to the end of the project, you know, things happen. You've gotta be able to adjust and reestablish yourself. And your CPA or your accountant will be one of the main players that you will go to for expertise on how to make sure that you come in on the, on the numbers that you have uh, agreed to with your uh, limited partner. And then finally, you know, again, 
If it's new construction on a vacant lot, obviously it's very, uh, certainly much easier to plan and execute. Um, if you do have an occupied site, um, I would really suggest that you get someone with some relocation experience to help you pull together uh, a plan for relocation uh, and to set out a, a, a reasonable time frame and really to get a handle on those costs. And that's it. And, and thank you. Thank you for uh, your time and your attentiveness. Well, um, I would like to thank everyone for um, watching our presentation today. I think uh, at this point, I would like to switch over to do some Q&A. I think that we're going to run out of time in a little bit. So I think what I would like to do is um, I'm going to see if we can get um, email addresses of those who have attended today and get at that from the partnership and see if we can send out our slides to you. Um, and what I would just recommend is that if you have any questions, you know, you can reach out to us and we definitely would love to uh, help you, uh, you know, be a resource for you, help you answer any questions you might have or, um, you know, kind of help you with anything from a next step perspective. Um, as, you know, from a Whittlesey or from Carol Martin or Dave Berto um, with their expertise, we certainly all would be uh, willing and able to help you uh, with any next steps and resources. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to transfer things back to Kylie and um, here. stop my screen sharing. Thanks so much, Ed. Thanks for everybody for joining us. I do see a couple of questions in the in the chat, so presenters, feel free to take note of that. Um, as Ed mentions we're going to make this um, we're going to make this session, this recording, available on our website along with all of uh, the other sessions from the conference. If you missed anything, don't worry, you'll be able to catch up and fast forward and find the sections um, that you wanted to go back over. Um, before we close, I'm just going to launch a poll, as I mentioned at the beginning. Please um, provide feedback. It's helpful for us and the presenters and everybody else to know um, how it's going. Uh, there is, as I noted in the chat, a session Friday morning with Chaffa. They're doing a QAP listening session to get some feedback on the QAP. Um, so I would really strongly encourage you to participate in that if you have thoughts and ideas about uh, the QAP, either from the uh, accounting, the developer perspective, the end user perspective, whatever that might be. Um, and again, that is Friday morning. So feel free to access our website, pschousing.org, to check out all the sessions and that one. With that, I'll launch our poll. And I want to say thank you so much to everybody uh, for participating today. We hope to see you again on some future sessions. And please feel free to reach out to the partnership and, as the presenter said, to each of them if we can be of any help. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you all. Take care. Oh, no.